Uh, and um, without further ado, I'd like to move on to introducing uh, our speaker for tonight. I'll just read a bit off her bio and then uh, give you a bit of my uh, personal story uh, regarding Shulamit. Uh, and she'll correct me if there's anything uh, on here that uh, uh, that I don't uh, that I don't point out, but you should all know I think from the materials you receive uh, that our guest speaker tonight, uh, Professor Shalami Magnus, is professor of Jewish history at Oberlin College. Uh, after teaching at Stanford, that's where you were beforehand, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, she received her bachelor's of arts uh, uh, from Barnard College and MA and PhD from Columbia University. Uh, and her first book, the Jewish Emancipation in a German City, Cologne, 1798 to 1871 was published in 1997, mm -hmm. uh, and um, if I understand correctly, the material you're going to be discussing tonight uh, is the subject of two books, two volumes of the same work, uh, one of which is currently in press and should still come out this year, it's an 09 imprint, uh, and the other hopefully uh, in the near future after that. Um, she's currently also working on a book of essays about Pauline Vengeroff's memoirs and their significance for the understanding of Jewish modernity the role of gender in modern Jewish memory and Jewish women's history, uh, in addition to several articles, uh, the boundary lines in Jewish modernity, community traditions about women's learning in Eastern Europe. Uh, and um, just on a personal note, uh, uh, Shulami joined the faculty at Oberlin, and uh, when she took her first sabbatical there, uh, created an opening on the faculty in Jewish history at Oberlin College, and just at the same time I was finishing my PhD uh, up at New York University, and just fortuitously brought me out to Ohio, and I've been here ever since. Uh, so um, my family enjoying now the lifestyle of being raised in Northeast Ohio. Uh, we all think she'll eat. So um, if she wasn't doing this research, I wouldn't be where I am. It's true. Um, so uh, please uh, sit back and enjoy. Uh, we have a nice uh, intimate setting for tonight. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have ample time for questions and anything else you might have to ask. Mm -hmm. Shalami Thank you. Great. Um, well, so the, uh, the, the work that I've been doing is in, on the memoirs of Pauline Bengaloff, um, who was born in 1833. Um, born in 1833 in, in uh, Bobryusk in Belarusia. She refers to it as Lithuania, but properly um, Belarusia. Um, and she died in 1916 in Minsk. And in between those years, she moved around in many places in the Pale of Settlement, the Jewish Pale of, pale of Settlement. Um, let me see if I can just open this. Yeah. Okay. So this is. This is a map um, of the Pale of Settlement. Um, it's probably a, a term that's familiar to most of you. Any, is it anyone who's not familiar with the term Pale of Settlement? Um, basically, it is, if we look at this, it's the, the um, westernmost provinces of Russia, spanning a, a huge swath of territory from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Before 1772, there were really no Jews in Russia. They were rigidly kept out. Um, tremendous amount of Judeophobia, and they were kept out. And then in the last third of the 18th century, in 1772, 1793, 1795, Poland was carved up. Um, it was dismembered by the great powers of the time, um, Prussia, Austria, and Russia. And Russia got the lion's share of what had been Poland and Ukraine. And there was a very significant Jewish population living there. How many, how many of you have roots going back to those places? I mean, many of us. Um, so the estimates vary, but the estimates are that at the end of the 18th century, when these three divisions of Poland occurred, there was, by the, by the last of them, there were perhaps something pushing a million Jews, like 900,000 perhaps which is a staggeringly high number in Jewish history. Um, Jewish communities are numbered often in the hundreds and the thousands. At this time, there are maybe a half a million Jews in all of German lands. There is no one Germanified state, but German lands, what today would be Germany and Austria. So if there's half a million in all of that, and you're talking about um, 
900,000 or so, this is a, you know, roughly double that size. It's much, much larger than any Jewish community anywhere else. Um, and so all of a sudden, Russia goes pretty much overnight from having no Jews to having a very substantial Jewish population. And what the Tsarist regimes did was basically to just say, not only to the Jews, but to the other populations in this area, Poles, Ukrainians, just stay put. Wherever you are, just stay there. And so what they did is they constructed this kind of border to protect, in their view, the interior of Russia from the um, deleterious, nefarious effects of Jewish settlement in the interior. And thus was created the origins of what we call the Pale of Settlement. Um, and so that's what this roughly, that's what we're talking about. And, and you can see in the distinction of color on the map, no. um, sort of, no. um, that roughly to here, right, this is what we're talking about. So in some sense, it's a ghetto, but it's huge. It's hundreds of thousands of square miles. That's a pale of settlement. And in the, what I did with this map is I just, I mapped onto this map the sites that Pauline Vengeroff either mentions or that were important in her life um, onto the Pale of the Settlement as a whole. So you can see, um, I don't have anything terrific to point with, but. Um, Bobryusk is here. This is where she was born. And very shortly after she was born, the family moved to Brest-Litovsk, which is the Jews called Brisk. Brisk is well known. Who has uh, uh, you know associations with it? What What do you know about Brisk? Well, I was my father was from Chantsov, and I was there three years ago, and there was actually a photo um, display an exhibit of uh, photography from that area. Uh huh. Any other any, anybody else have any associations with Brisk Brest Litovsk? There's the Litovskys. <laughs> Famous, Who knows? Yeah. Um, if, if many of these towns are, you know, founts of uh, great um, rabbinic families. Uh, Brisk is particularly associated with the Soloveitchik family and various other extremely eminent families. And Vengerov's uh, family name is Epstein, and it is also a well-known rabbinic name. Um, her, but you can see what that it is right on the border of what this was turned into. This was the rump of what was left of Poland. Poland had originally stretched from Ukraine all the way to the north. It was a very extremely important kingdom in medieval times, Poland, Lithuania. This is what was left. It was called the Kingdom of Poland, Congress Poland. It was supposedly self-governing. It was made part of the Russian Empire. In any case, brest as you can see, is on the border of Poland. And she had a grandfather who lived in Warsaw which is an extremely important city. It's also right near the border of Prussia, which is the easternmost German uh, state and an important power, which had also uh, t had taken a huge chunk of Poland, Posen, and taken it. And that, that's, that's where the family is situated. Um, so let's put her back on. Um, OK, here's another image. By the way, these are original photos, as you can see, mm -hmm. that I got from a great-great-grandchild. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a picture of her. And what, what do you see when you, when you see this? What? Beautiful. Powerful. Mm -hmm. yes. How so? Strong face, mm -hmm. strong hands, large hands, <laughs> beautifully dressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Expensive coat. What's that? Expensive coat. Expensive, yeah. yeah. Right. So wealthy, not poor. I could easily show you some other pictures of people who tended to be photographed usually were not the poorest people. Well, but she's clearly. Also standing like a man would mm -hmm. stand in that painting. It isn't a. Oh, usually you see women in photographs, they're seated, they're. Uh, just and the, the, the stance is, uh, of very, is very yeah. dominant. Interesting, interesting. Well, at Fitzer. Um, Strong yes. jaw. Uh-huh. You see determination. Is she wearing a fur or, or a dress? Um, it looks to me like it might be fur trimmed. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe a, a fur shawl or something, or a collar. That is a pretty good one. 